This evening at the Granada Forum, we welcome presidential candidate Ted Gunderson. As regards his background, he is a former special agent in charge of Los Angeles Office of the FBI. He served there for 27 and a half years. In 1979, he founded the Ted L. Gunderson and Associates. It's a Santa Monica based firm doing international security consulting and investigation. F. Lee Bailey, Esquire, the famous attorney, once described Ted Gunderson as a person with investigative skills that are unsurpassed by anyone I know or have known. Tonight he will be speaking on his recent experiences on the campaign trail as a Democratic candidate for President of the United States. We'll hear about his platform and plan to return America to the constitutional government. Additionally, he'll talk about the Oklahoma City bombing, Satanism, child abduction, and drug running. Now please join me in giving Ted a warm welcome. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. And, um, you know, I kind of changed my lecture around driving up here today, and I just prepared something brand new. I'm getting kind of tired of the drugs in the Oklahoma City. And, but uh, maybe we can go into that in the question and answer. In fact, I welcome it. But uh, several years ago, I gave a lecture in uh, Las Vegas. And after the lecture, a man walked up to me uh, without the identifying himself, without introducing himself, and he said, I want to present this to you. I want you to understand what you're combating and what the problems are in this country at the very lowest level and at the highest level, too. And he handed me this book. It's called Pawns in the Game. And this book is written by William Guy Carr, and he's a retired commander. And uh, basically what it is, it's a story about the, the secret government, the shadow government, uh, the Illuminati, and for a long time I've thought, you know, I think that we should all know about that. And that's something that oftentimes on the radio shows they don't want you to get into because people seem to be afraid of it. And many of the announcers and the hosts don't like to get into too many controversial matters. What do you want me to do? Oh, hold it up? Sure. Uh -huh. So what I'd like to do tonight, and we'll discuss those other uh, matters, uh, Oklahoma City bombing and my political career, which uh, so far has been very exciting and uh, very interesting. Uh, and the question and answer, if we may. Uh, by the way, okay, take it down. Thank you. Okay. Um, how long a program do we want, would we like to have here tonight? Can somebody tell me so I can kind of time it? Hour and 15. Hour and 15, okay. When the bell goes off at 9.15, why, if you want to just get up and walk out, I'll understand. <laughs> okay. But uh, let's, talk about the, let's talk about the Illuminati. After all, uh, based on everything that I've been able to come up with and research, really that's the very essence of the problem in this country today and around the world, really. And it was founded on May the, 5th, May the 1st, 1776, by Adam Weishaupt. He was a German, and the basic philosophy of the Illuminati was superior beings with superior intelligence have the right to rule those less gifted because the masses don't know what is best for them. That sounds kind of like an interesting situation. And um, so I'm going to just kind of go to the book and then we're going to go back to real practical experiences and then we're going to go back and forth. We're going to kind of pick this book apart. It'll be a, I think it'll be an interesting lecture. First time, I, as I said, I prepared this coming up from Las Vegas, so I told my friend Bob Duffy over here, Bob, if it's too dry, just tell me I won't give it again, okay? <laughs> But anyway, uh, Weinstrop organized the Illuminati to put the plot into execution. The words Illuminati is derived from Lucifer and means holder of the light. Using the lie that his objective was to bring about a one world government to enable men with proven mental ability to govern the world, he recruited about 2,000 followers. <clears throat> And these included the most intelligent men in the field of the arts and letters, education, the science, finance, and industry. He then established lodges in the Grand Orient to be their secret headquarters. And Weistrop's revised plan required his Illuminati to do the following things to help him accomplish their purpose. Number one, 
use monetary and sex bribery to obtain control of people already occupying positions in high places in the various levels of all governments and other fields of human endeavor. Once an influential person had fallen for the lies, deceits, and temptations of the Illuminati, they were to be held in bondage by application of political and other forms of blackmail and threats of financial ruin, public exposure, and physical harm, and even death to themselves and to their loved ones. Now, I became involved in the Jeffrey R. McDonald case. I'm sure many of you remember that case. And that was my first exposure to the Illuminati. Within 10 months of entering the case, I obtained a signed confession from Helena Stokely. The Jeffrey R. McDonald case, is there anybody that does not remember that case? He's a former Green Beret doctor who was convicted of murdering his wife and two children. February 17, 1970, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He didn't do it. <clears throat> October 25, I obtained a confession from Helena Stokely, right down here in Westwood, in my office. And at that time, she said that Dr. McDonald did not commit those crimes. Those crimes were committed by my satanic cult group. And being, as I've been in the FBI 27 and a half years, almost 28 years, I believe it or not, I really didn't know anything about Satanism or about satanic activity. That was my first exposure to it. And since then, believe me, uh, in researching and in, um, as a matter of practical experience, I've run across it time and time again. So the first phase of Mr. Weistrop's um, proposal was drugs and sex and blackmail, right? Well, in, my last, in the last 16 years I've been involved in this field, I just have a few headlines here. Washington Times, power broker served drugs, sex at parties, bug for blackmail. Homosexual prostitution probe and snarls officials of Bush and Reagan, Washington Times again. Top Japanese politician linked to Spence, that's Craig Spence. Craig Spence was a CIA uh, operative whose specialty was to set up and blackmail prominent politicians, dignitaries, ambassadors, and so forth. And once they were blackmailed, then, of course, our government, mainly the CIA, for the most part, had them in their hip pocket. So that's a very common thing. <clears throat> and. Uh, also, I've run across this situation in the Nebraska case. I began, uh, I became involved in the Nebraska case. It's called the Franklin cover-up in late 1989. And uh, as a result of my investigation uh, and working with John DeCamp, uh, we developed information about the children who were being taken out of private schools in Omaha, boys and girls, uh, by private limousine to Sioux City, Iowa, 120 miles away, placed on private jets and flown to Washington, D.C. for sex orgy parties with congressmen and senators and prominent uh, politicians, governors and uh, ambassadors. So these kids, some of these children were also taken to uh, the Republican National Convention in New Orleans and also in Dallas, Texas. It's a typical situation. Now, when it comes time to vote on a particular bill, and somebody comes around and says, I want you to vote this way because you remember we were at that party the other day and there was that 10-year-old kid back in the bedroom with you. How do you think he's going to vote, right? And I might mention that uh, the kids all placed George Bush at one of those parties when he was vice president. Our George Bush, which doesn't surprise me, of course. Okay, the next point in question with this, uh, the Illuminati and uh, Mr. Weissop's uh, ideas is the Illuminati on the campuses and uh, on, the, on the faculties of colleges and universities to re we recommend students possessing exceptional mental ability belonging to well-bred families with international learnings for special training in internationalism. This training was to be provided by granting scholarships to those selected. They were to be educated and indoctrinated into accepting the idea that only one world government can put an end to recurring wars and tribulations. They were to be at first persuaded and then convinced that men of special ability and brains had the right to rule those less gifted because the, the goyim, meaning the masses of the people, didn't know what is best for them physically, mentally, and spiritually. And then it goes on and it mentions the three specific schools. And then the third point uh, in his platform was to influence 
influential people trapped into coming under the control of the Illuminati, the students had to be especially educated and trained, were to be used a, as agent tour and placed behind the scenes of all governments, all governments as experts and specialists, so they could advise the top executives to adopt policies which would, in the long run, serve the secret plans of the one-worlders and bring about the ultimate destruction of the governments and religions they were elected or appointed to serve. Now let's think back to uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You remember his Secretary of State, what was his name? I was trying to think of it. Cordell Hall. Cordell Hall. One, and, and just recently, well, it wasn't Cordell Hall, was he? Huh? No, it was the, he was, uh, he's been, a, it's been documented since the uh, Soviet Union. I can't think of his name. Stenson? No, it wasn't it. Anyway. No, that wasn't it either. Well, we'll f I'll tell you, recently, I, I, was think I was trying to think about this coming up, and I couldn't think of his name. I'll find out from the next lecture, by the way. Well, wasn't, he won secretary, he was the top advisor, and he went with him to Yalta, Franklin Delano Roosevelt to Yalta. Yes, yes. And his, it's been documented since the uh, fall of the wall, the Berlin Wall, it's been documented that Alger Hiss was, in fact, a Soviet spy. And look what we gave away at Yalta. So this is typical. The fourth point, the Illuminati were to obtain control of the press and all other agencies which distribute information to the public. News and information was to be slanted so that the uh, uh, Joyum, Goyum would come to believe that a one world government is the only solution to our many and varied problems. Well, I don't probably have to talk to you much about the one world controlled press because that's exactly what they are. And I've had some experience on the campaign trail in that regard. Um, in late November, I decided to run for President of the United States. I'd been a Republican all my life. But I felt that uh, to be the most effective candidate, I should, uh, for the first time, uh, register as a Democrat, and I did. And as a result, I went to a number of Democratic rallies, and um, I uh, publicly stated uh, how I felt, and uh, I was not too popular. I was kind of like the, uh, the, <laughs> the bastard at the family reunion, if I may say. And as a matter of fact, I remember in Galveston, I, uh, I stood behind this fellow, at the, at, we were registering, and I introduced myself and told him I was running for president on the Democratic ticket. I told him he had a choice. He had a conservative Democrat, a Jeffersonian Democrat, or Bill Clinton. He said, I've already decided to vote for my friend Bill. I said, well, let me talk to you a little bit about you. I don't want to talk to you. Well, I'd like, no, I don't want to talk to you. I tried it four times, and he wouldn't let me get the one word in. So that was kind of typical of what happened to me. But at that same rally, there was a judge who was master of ceremonies. And uh, after the, uh, the program was over, and uh, uh, Richard uh, Gibhart spoke there, by the way. <laughs> and after the program was over, uh, I went up and shook hands with the judge, and he very quietly said, uh, well, I have to say that uh, I admire what you're doing. And, uh, but he also said, don't tell anybody I told you that. Right? <laughs> uh, New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, uh, the first press release that came out gave uh, Clinton uh, as 94% uh, of the vote. And the rest of us all had 6%. Uh, now, I registered in New Hampshire, and unfortunately, I was not able to even make a trip to New Hampshire because uh, my finances were so tight. But I did end up 11th out of 21 candidates, so there's somebody up there that knows about me anyway. Uh, but, uh, in checking behind the scenes, so to speak, I learned that the truth of the matter was that Bill Clinton received 91%, the rest of us received 6%, and 3% of the people took their ballots and didn't vote for anybody. So that's, of course, one of the ways that they do it. Austin, Texas, uh, one Sunday here, a couple of Sundays ago, they had a rally at the uh, state capitol building for the Branch Davidians. And I was asked to appear there as a speaker, make a few comments. I was about the fourth or fifth speaker, as I, I was the fifth speaker, as a matter of fact, and 
They had some of the victims uh, and uh, some of the victims who were able to get out of there. One man, I felt so sorry for him, he lost his 18-year-old daughter. He was also there and was able to get out. They had the relatives of the victims and so forth. And I was the last speaker. And when I got up to speak, a CBS affiliate there took the cameras down and walked off. And, uh, and so I, w I started talking about some of the problems we have in this country, you know, little things like billions of dollars of drug money laundered through BCCI and a savings and loan fiasco where people lost their whole life savings and uh, Ruby Ridge and Waco. And, um, and I felt that the media should at least be aware of it since they don't ever print anything about those various <laughs> items. And uh, they just kept on walking. And finally, I just said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you've been betrayed and we've been betrayed. We've been betrayed by the White House. We've been betrayed by Congress. We've been betrayed by the politicians. And worst of all, we've been betrayed by the American press and by the American media. <laughs> and um, I pointed at him. I said, this is the perfect example. They were walking off to the left. And they turned around, st stopped, and looked at me, and, I, and I, I signaled them out. In Iowa, just the other day, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, if it even came over on the uh, news service, uh, Peter, I don't know if it did or not, but I heard about it through my sources. Um, the precinct captains in Iowa were given instructions to call the results of each of their precincts to the voter news service first and foremost. Now, the voter news service is uh, made up of uh, representatives from CBS, NBC, ABC, CNN, and the Associated Press. And they did that, just that. And I also heard through various sources that on that particular day, there were eight primaries. This was a caucus in Iowa, of course, but there were a total of eight, including this caucus. And in Iowa, uh, excuse me, in the six of the eight, the precinct captains, the Republican precinct captains, were given the same instructions. They can't prove it in the other five because they were all using computers, and it's impossible to determine if a computer is accurate or not after the fact. There's no way to go back and check on it. But in the Iowa situation, they went back and they found out that they shaved 13 percent of the votes off of Buchanan. And uh, I understand that story was broken in the Manchester Union Leader, which is a Republican paper in Manchester, well-known paper, but I didn't see it any place and I've been uh, trying to be alert for it. Was it, did it come across the news service? Okay, that's typical of the American media and American press. Now let's talk a little bit about the computers, and uh, this something absolutely has to be done about these electronic voting machines. John DeCamp, a good friend of mine, an attorney in Lincoln, Nebraska, was running for governor of the state of Nebraska in the last election. A week before the poll, the week before the election, he was first in the polls. First time in the history of the Omaha World Herald, by the way, that they had never published the results of the polls. Now, there's a reason for that, because John DeCamp had identified one of the main perpetrators in the Nebraska Franklin cover-up case as Harold, P. Harold Anderson, former publisher of the Omaha World Herald. And, of course, Bob Wadman, chief of police, was one of the individuals identified by the children. And Eugene Mahoney, head of the Nebraska Forestry Service, was identified, uh, and two other very prominent citizens there in Lincoln. But he ended up uh, in the election coming in third. So he was leading the week before, ended up in third. He checked in, John and his associates, his people, checked into these computer, the computer system. And basically, the way that it works is this way. The ballots are put into the box at each location, and then two people from each party at each, at, at each machine, and one person from the elected committee is at that machine also. Now, they run, say, 120 ballots through the machine just as a sample. And if they all check out, uh, then they continue to run the rest of them. And they say, well, this machine is all right because the 120 were accurate. But the trouble is they can set those machines so that starting with number 139, somebody else gets the vote. In fact, there's a lady in New Orleans who, after the election, she was defeated. After the election, she went down and personally checked the machine. She punched her name, and the vote came up as her opponent's vote. So 
Something has to be done. I think they need to outlaw those. Uh, speaking of drugs, and as we're talking about basically the Illuminati, I'm going to mention one of the programs that's being used uh, by a clandestine group of U.S. government operatives, primarily the CIA. It's called the Black Rose. And it, it has for many years run illegal drugs and arm operations, uh, both uh, Southeast Asia via the Golden Triangle and the Middle East via the Golden Crescent founded by the British Socialist-based uh, Russell Trust drug cartel. The Black Rose current chairman and co-founder is an individual known as the White Rose, or GHWB, also known as, uh, better known as George Bush. Indeed, it was Bush who, as top member of the Skull and Bone Society, developed the heroin ring, which uh, serviced as ambassador along with his CIA activities. The Black Rose also run, ran cocaine through Panama from Colombia to the offshore oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico, owned by the Bush family, the Zapata Oil Company. Um, don't mean to pick on George Bush, but I'll get around to Clinton in a few minutes, okay? But well, my point, I think my point here is I don't think there's a dime's worth of difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. <laughs> Sorry, Betty. I have a very prominent Republican lady sitting right down here who's a dear friend of mine. Past president of the Ladies Republican Club, right, Betty? I remember I spoke to him when I was in the FBI. But she's, a, she's not one of them, though, I guarantee you that. But um, anyway... Um, well, you know, we really have some problems in this country, and I don't think there's that much difference between Bush, Dole, or Clinton, any, all the three of them. And I'm going to discuss, I'll discuss Dole a little bit later on. But anyway, in, a, in a, a subsequent meeting of the Illuminati on July the 16th, 1982, they came up with a seven-part goal. Now listen to this closely. Order, or they came up with the order of chaos. Create chaos in your society, in your home. Abolishment of private property, abolishment of inheritance, abolishment of patriotism, abolishment of all religions, abolishment of the family, and creation of a new world order. I'm going to just give you next a little summary of the Communist Manifesto. One, abolishment of private property, heavy progressive income tax, Abolishment of all rights of inheritance. Confiscation of property of all immigrants and rebels. A central bank. Government control of communication and transportation. Government ownership of factories and agriculture. Government control of labor. Cooperative farms, regional planning. Government control of education. Let's go back to the book now. Now, in 1773, when uh, Meyer Rothschild was only 30 years of age, he invited 12 other wealthy and influential men to meet him in Frankfurt. His purpose was to convince them that if they agreed to pool their resources, they could then finance and control the World Revolutionary Movement and use it as their manual of action to win ultimate control of the wealth, natural resources, and manpower of the entire world. During this meeting, this was recorded, by the way. These are just, there were, there were 26 various uh, points, uh, topics that were discussed, but I'm just going to skip through a few of them that I think apply to our situation here today. And uh, during this meeting, it was discussed and he argued that the use of any and all means to reach their final goal was justified on the grounds that the ruler who governed by the moral code was not a skilled politician because he left himself vulnerable and in an unstable position on the throne. He said those who wish to rule must have recourse to cunning and to make believe because great national qualities like frankness and honesty are vices in politics. Okay. Item, that was no item number four. Uh, item number eight. I'm skipping through because it'd be too long if I read them all. Okay. He next advocated that the use of, listen to this, alcohol, 
drugs, moral corruption, and all forms of vice be used systematically by their agenteurs to corrupt the morals of the youth of the nation. He recommended that the special agenteurs should be trained as tutors, governesses, clerks, and by women in the places of dissip dissipation frequented by the goyims. That's the mass of the people, by the way. He added, quote, in the number of these last, I count also the so-called society ladies who become voluntary followers of the others in corruption and luxury. We must not stop at bribery, deceit, and treachery when they should serve towards the attainment of their end, of our end. So we talk about drugs. And is it not obvious what's going on in this country? What about Iran-Contra, arms for drugs. I personally have talked to two CIA pilots who were involved in the drug operation. You know, one of them spoke here recently, Terry Reed. Another one's a good friend of mine in Dallas, Texas. And uh, why neither one of these people have been uh, suicided, I will never know. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the one in Dallas uh, has been sent to jail and uh, he, attempts were made on his life once he was in the prison. So uh, our friend uh, Bill Clinton uh, was fully aware of the situation in Arkansas when he was governor. In fact, the MENA Arkansas operation lasted for at least 10 years. It was personally brought to his attention by Larry Nichols. I think you, some of you heard Larry Nichols last night. But Bill Clinton told Larry, well, it's, a state, it's not a state matter, it's a federal matter. The Arkansas Redevelopment uh, Authority was designed uh, by Bill Clinton and some of his colleagues, and every loan that was supposed to have been made for the churches and the schools and the students, every loan was personally signed by Bill Clinton. This is documented in uh, Clinton Chronicles, and the most recent of which is Clinton Chronicles 2. Have any of you seen Clinton Chronicles 2? It's available. Do we have any back there? It is available, I think, at our table. It's, there may be somebody else is selling it also. Uh, but there's no question about the Mena, Arkansas situation. In that 10-year period, there was not one confiscation of an automobile, a railroad, or an airplane with drugs, and there was not one conviction, in spite of the fact that the governor of the state of Arkansas, Bill Clinton, knew fully well about the operation. The police officers who attempted to investigate the case were either reassigned, and some of Bill Clinton's personal security guards, one in particular, was murdered. And five of the security men said that on at least 100 occasions, Bill Clinton was involved with at least 100 different women. In other words, he's a womanizer. As, um, Congressman Denemeyer said he's a womanizing, draft dodging. What's that? Spot smoking. <laughs> liar. Pathological liar. <laughs> Pathological liar. And he should be impeached. And I'll have to go along with that. <laughs> now, what about the CIA? Well, I first ran into uh, CIA drug operations and also Army drug operations, again, going right back to the Jeffrey R. McDonald case. I couldn't believe that they were bringing drugs, and I was kind of a Boy Scout, I guess, being in the FBI. We were, it was a good organization then. I was apple pie, Chevrolet, and all that, and very patriotic. I still am, of course. But I couldn't believe that our boys, who died for us in the Southeast, were being used, their body cavities were used, by placing drugs in plastic bags and being brought into this country by army personnel, top-ranking officers, police officers involved in the Jeffrey McDonald case, at least two attorneys. And by the way, this is documented in Time Magazine, January 1, 1973. And then the Nugenhan Bank was set up in Sydney, Australia, specifically to launder uh, money coming out of Southeast Asia in the 60s and the early 70s. And then we had BCCI. And who's behind this, primarily? The CIA. The CIA. I've talked to CIA agents who told me that we make other terrorists in the country look like a Sunday school class. That we are the most treacherous, 
terrorists active in the world today. The CIA is. I don't know if you're aware of MK Ultra, the mind control program, or if you're aware of some of these other operations that the uh, CIA has. I have a whole list of them. It would take me two hours if I started reviewing them with you. But uh, this is disgraceful. Disgraceful, not only as human beings, but also as a democratic organization and country. We're actually a totalitarian, totalitarian country, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so we have drugs, and then the next uh, item that on the agenda in the book says, number six, he then <coughs> uh, admonished his listeners with these words, quote, the power of our resources must remain invisible until the very moment when it has gained such strength that no cunning or force can undermine it. He warned them that any deviation from the line of the strategical plan he was making known to them would risk bringing to naught the labors of centuries. That pretty well speaks for itself. Uh, I think that the Illuminati and this evil element in our society has been very good, mainly through control of the media, in uh, uh, not uh, alerting the American people as to what the underlying problems are in this particular area. And uh, that's all organized. And then uh, item number nine, turning to politics. He claimed, this is at that meeting now, remember? He claimed that they had the right to seize property by any means and without hesitation if by doing so they secure submission and sovereignty. He pronounced, quote, our state marching <clears throat> along the path of peaceful conquest has the right to replace the horrors of war by less noticeable and more satisfactory sentences of death necessary to maintain the terror which tends to produce blind submission. Are you familiar with uh, Dianne Feinstein's uh, federal land takeover, right? I know you are. Are you familiar with the laws that allow um, our alphabet teams BATF, FBI, and others to come in and seize assets? Are you aware that there's a statute? I haven't seen this with my own eyes yet. I've been told this. And when I say it's true, it's true because I've documented it or I've had the research on it. This I don't have the research on. I've been told there was a statute passed recently that allowed the federal government to seize uh, land and uh, additional uh, uh, criminal charges, misdemeanors other than mainly drugs, which is what they've used in the past. I know of person, individual after individual, who's lost their land, lost their property. So this kind of follows with the pattern. There's a Financial Crimes Enforcement Network active in the country today. And it's a little known agency within the Treasury Department, whose subversive mission is to monitor every dime you earn track every dollar you spend, and identify all your assets and property for later confiscation. They haven't been doing too well with me lately, I'll tell you. <laughs> that's, the way, that's the way they keep you down and out, is they keep you broke. And then uh, there's an uh, international biofear uh, reverse, reser reserves it is. In the New World Order, this team of, uh, for a section of land that has been turned over to the World Conservation Bank in lieu of payment of the debt to the World Bank. In the U.S., largely unknown to most, by most Americans, uh, many uh, beautiful national parks and wilderness are quietly being turned over to the world bankers, the Rothschild and the Rockefellers cartel, as payment on the national debt areas such as Smoky Mountain National Park, these are then cleared of any citizens and zealously patrolled by U.S. Forestry Services. By the way, most recently I learned that uh, in recent years, U.S. Forestry Services are now carrying firearms. They didn't used to carry firearms in the old days. In fact, the entire Amazon basin of Brazil is now the property of the prime Philip of England, who heads the International Biosphere Reverse Reserve for the World Conservation Bank. This is happening all over the world, ladies and gentlemen. Item number 11. He next uh, expounded his theories regarding war. 
In 1773, he set down a principle which the governments of Britain and the United States publicly announced as their joint policy in 1939. Now, wait a minute. This is 1773, and he talked about a war in 1939? This is documented, ladies and gentlemen. He said it should be the policy of those present to foment wars but to direct the peace conferences so that neither of the combatants obtain territorial gains. Yalta, I'd say. I think the Russians came out far ahead of us. He said the war should be directed so that the nations engaged on both sides would be placed further in their debt and in the power of our agent tours. Wars. These are the people that tell us when we go to war. These are the people, the World Bank, the silent bank, the behind-the-scenes uh, agency, World Bank, Federal Reserve, you name it, they're the ones that tell us who's going to be in the White House, who's going to be elected. And if they can't get them in the White House, they can always just not have a primary like we did in Kansas recently with Bob Dole, right, if it doesn't look too good for him. Okay, number 12. He next dealt with administration. <clears throat> He told those present that they must use their wealth to have candidates chosen for a public office who would uh, be obedient to our commands, this is in quotes, so they may readily be used as pawns in our game by the learned and ingenious men we will appoint to operate behind the scenes of government as official advisors. He added that the men we appoint as advisors will have been bred, reared, and trained from childhood in accordance with our ideas to rule the affairs of the whole world. Well, I just mentioned the Nebraska case. They're uh, running kids back there, blackmailing politicians. I recall another case um, as a result of the McDonald investigation. I became a so-called satanic expert and have testified as an expert witness on satanic cult matters. I recall a lady in New York City came to me, and she had been in the cult had been raised in the cult as a multi-generation member of the satanic cult group, her mother and father, grandmother, and so forth. And she was sent to law school specifically to learn about immigration uh, into this country, that she was an immigration attorney, and she told me herself that she used to make trips to Europe to pick up children and bring them into Kennedy Airport and turn the children over to two men, or a man and a woman, who she had never even seen before. Item number 13, he dealt with propaganda and explained how their combined wealth could control all outlets of public information while they remained in the shade and clear of blame regardless of what the repercussions might be due to the publications of libel, slander, or untruths. The speaker said, thanks to the press, we have got gold in our hands, notwithstanding the fact that we had to gather it out of the oceans of blood and tears, but it has paid us even through, though we have sacrificed many of our own people. Each victim on our side is worth a thousand uh, goyims. Um, propaganda, libel, slander. Um, in the Nebraska case again, the children have identified Warren Buffett as being involved in this operation, this, this ring. Warren Buffett's the richest man in America. Warren Buffett is a major stockholder, ABC Television. Warren Buffett is a major stockholder in the Washington Post. I recall recently speaking to the media after the Oklahoma City bombing. I was interviewed by uh, Nightline, NBC. Is that Nightline or Dateline, Peter? Nightline. Yeah. And uh, Chris Hansen interviewed me. and. Um, the producer was an uh, Italian named uh, Joe, some, I forget his name offhand. Anyway, I, they, they had me come over to the hotel in Las Vegas. They came to Las Vegas. And I went over, and we sat down, and they interviewed me for two and a half hours. And they kept asking me the same question over and over, and over. one question they must have asked me 10 or 12 times. And I've been dealing with the media for, well, for about 20 25 or 30 years. So I knew what he was doing. He's waiting for me to give the weakest answer or a poor answer or a different answer so that they could uh, discredit me. <clears throat> and uh, this happens to me on, on a regular occasion. 
after Chris Hansen finished, I don't know if any of you saw that, uh, the final product, but they tried to make me look like an idiot on national television. I don't think they succeeded. I was told they didn't. Uh, the producer said to me, and there had just been an article in Spotlight magazine about uh, how I talked about the Oklahoma City bombing. It was the big lie, which it still is, and I still claim it is, and I know it is. And um, John Doe, too, by the way, is either a government agent or an operative. There's no question about it. I'll be glad to tell you why I think that later on, the questions and answers. And, and, and the producer said, uh, okay, Chris was through. He said, uh, Mr. Gunnarsson, would you tell us about your alignment with Spotlight magazine? I said, I'm not aligned with anybody. I said, I will talk to any member of the press if he wants to interview me. After all, I'm talking to you, aren't I? And, uh, and Chris, I, I recall, he kind of grinned a little bit. Uh, but that was typical. And they were there specifically to try to discredit me, to embarrass me. There's no question about it. The other two people they put on, a fellow named Jackson, who was an ex-con, and the Thompson, I think, was the Thompson lady. Um, you know, Van, you remember the one that said that the Japanese did it? Yeah. Uh, they, they, they did a pretty good job on them. But then, <clears throat> number 15. He next explained how industrial depressions and financial panic could be brought about and used to serve their purposes, saying, enforced unemployment and hunger imposed on the masses because of the power we have to create shortages of food will create the right of capital rule more surely than it was given uh, to the real uh, aristoc aristocracy and by the legal authority of kings. He claimed that by having their agent tour control the mob, the mob could then be used to wipe out all who dared to stand in the way. Well, let's think about that. What about uh, all the farms that are being taken away from the farmers in the Midwest? They're going to the big conglomerates. Um, and we're talking about uh, shortage of food. Right now, there's a shortage of food. There's uh, 50 large grain elevators that are secretly hidden in the Midwest that are full of grain from the federal government. The federal government is storing them there. We have a shortage of food uh, for the first time in years. People don't realize that there's only about a three-week backup in the supermarkets. And Kissinger at one time several years ago made the statement, if you want to control the population, you control the flow of food and the food supply. What does that do? If they make us hungry and starving, we're not going to be very good fighters, right? And then, of course, as far as financial panic is concerned, as I mentioned earlier, BCCI, billions of dollars lost their savings and loan, and so forth. Item number 19. Dis diplomacy was next discussed. After all wars, secret diplomacy must be insisted upon in order that our agent tour, masquerading as political, financial, and economic advisors, can carry out their mandates without fear of exposing who are the secret powers behind the national and international affairs. The speaker then told those present that by secret diplomacy, they must obtain such control, quote, that the nations cannot come to even an inconsiderable private agreement without our secret agents having it on hand. Number 20, the ultimate world government is the goal. To reach this goal, the speaker told them, it would be necessary to establish huge monopolies, reservoirs of such colossal riches that even the largest fortunes of the, of the Goyams will depend on us to such an extent that they will go to the bottom together with the credit of their governments on the day after the great political smash. The speaker then added, you gentlemen here present who are economists, just strike an estimate of the significance of this combination. I think that's happening to us today. Are you familiar with the um, meeting in San Francisco, September 27th, October 1st? Gorbachev, Bush led the charge, Margaret Thatcher was there to establish Plans for a global civilization. Here's a newspaper article to that effect. Number 21, economic war. Plans to rob the Goyams of their landed properties and industries were then discussed. A combination of high taxes and unfair competition was advocated to bring about the economic ruin of the Goyam as far as their national financial interests and investments were concerned. In the international field, he felt that he could be encouraged to price themselves out of the markets. They could be achieved by the careful control of raw materials, organized agitation among the workers for shorter hours and higher pay, and by subsidizing competitors. 
The Speaker warned his co-conspirators that they must arrange matters and control conditions so that the increased wages obtained by the workers will not benefit them in any way. What about NAFTA and GAAP? In the oil industry, from the period of 1986 to 1992, there were at one point 4,000 oil rigs in the independent oil industry. There's less than 700 as of 1992. Instead of developing our own natural resources, the oil industry in this country, what we're doing, we're bringing them in at the rate of 15 million barrels per day in 12 super tankers out of the Middle East. And George Bush and his family, the Zapata Oil Company, own a number of those super tankers. I've been told also by a CIA informant that they're not only bringing oil in those super tankers, but they're also bringing drugs in those super tankers. In the 26 years, from 1946 to 1971, the U.S. trade surplus, I emphasize this, surplus, $98 billion, the economy grew at the rate of 4.8% per year, the national debt rose $148 billion. In a 23-year period from 1972 to 1994, the U.S. suffered a $1.6 trillion trade deficit. The economy grew 3.8%. The federal debt soared an annual rate of 3,200%, more than any preceding 26 years by $4.3 trillion. NAFTA and GATT, they've put out uh, vineyards out of business. I understand that there's a high employment, unemployment rate in the San Diego area and that the number of the companies are moving over into Mexico across the border, putting our people out of work. And we are losing jobs in this country at the rate of 16,300 jobs a week. So far since GATT and NAFTA have passed, American labor market has lost over 800,000 jobs. Item number 24, importance of youth. The importance of capturing the interests of youth with emphasize and um, admonish, admonition, I'm sorry about that, that our agent tours should infiltrate into all classes and levels of society and government for the purpose of fooling, bemusing, and corrupting the younger members of society by teaching them theories and principles we know to be false. Okay, let's talk about the youth for a while. How about these children in the Nebraska case? Paul Benassi, one of four children who refused to recant his signed statement, there were 80 children came forward in that case, said that he was part of an organized child kidnapping ring when he was 10, 11, 12 years old. He was used as a decoy to attract other children in public locations, parks, um, par uh, malls, and so forth, over to the car, and the adults would grab them and throw them in the car. Reader's Digest, July 1982, uh, more than 100,000 children disappear every year and are never heard from again. I'm not talking about runaway teenagers. I'm talking about two, three, four, five, six-year-old kids. In the Nebraska case, Paul said that these kids are kept in safe houses across the country and ultimately auctioned off in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, an airstrip there, and also Toronto, Canada. And the, in this particular case, he said he's attended six such auctions in uh, Las Vegas. The least number of children were six, the most were 36. The average kid, 10, 11, 12 years old, blue-eyed, blonde hair, sells for about $50,000. I wrote a letter to the um, Attorney General of the United States, William Barr, wrote a letter to the FBI, wrote a letter to the governor of the state of Nebraska, I wrote a letter to the attorney general of the state of Nebraska, and I told him about this. <clears throat> and I told him, <clears throat> don't believe me, I only used to be in charge of the FBI in Southern California, come see me, I'll give you my sources. <clears throat> you can talk to the people that I talked to, the people that gave me statements. <clears throat> and you know what, I received two responses. Number one, uh, my sources were not credible. Number two, um, you're, you don't have the proper documentation. I immediately documented my uh, information and sent a 20-page document back. I have not received any response today. How about the McMartin case? Okay, everybody's familiar with that being in this area. Uh, you are aware, of course, that the children said they were taken down in tunnels under the school, and they were taken through the tunnels up into the triplex next door, taken out into automobiles and prostitutes. These are the two, three, four-year-old children. 
And the authorities came in and said, well, I don't think these children are, are, are telling the truth. They're imagining this. And um, so they said they were fantasizing. And of course, we know what happened. Ray Bucky was a uh, hung jury twice out. The, uh, Virginia, or uh, the old lady, Miss McMartin, uh, acquitted. Well, in the spring of 1990, I had an opportunity to gain control of the McMartin uh, property. It had been sold from the McMartin family, the defense attorney, to a private contractor who was going to build an office on there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. See some water back here. And uh, I signed a contract, assumed liability, and uh, took a professional archaeologist in, Dr. Gary Stickle. We spent 34 days, 24 hours a day on that property. We guarded, of course, we didn't want anybody coming in and contaminating the evidence. And we found tunnels under the school. The authorities claimed they looked for tunnels. They couldn't find them. We found them. And as far as I'm concerned, the children were telling the truth. But as an outgrowth of this investigation, uh, the McMartin family admitted to one of the mothers, I think it was Virginia McMartin, that she'd been all over the world setting up preschools because they were experts in this particular field. And Roland Summit, a prominent psychiatrist at UCLA, has made the statement in his research that there are at least 50 such schools across the country, preschools, where the children claim they were taken down into tunnels under the school. Now, in discussing the youth, <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about the Finders case. I was able to gain access to an official Department of Treasury investigation, customs investigation, and I have it in front of me right now. And in 1987, uh, the Tallahassee, Florida Police Department received a call, anonymous call, from a lady who said that there were two strange-looking men with six children in the park. They went out, <clears throat> they went out and checked the, the children out and saw the men. The men were well-dressed. <clears throat> the children were rather simply dressed. The children did not, not know how to use the toilet facilities or the telephone. The police arrested them. As a result of information in the van, they found the computer disks and so forth. Uh, the police uh, sent the information to the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Metropolitan Police, with search warrants, went out and checked the uh, location where the children were kept and the warehouse where some of the activities supposedly took place. <clears throat> they found computer disks, and they found evidence of satanic cult activities and ceremonies. <clears throat> they found pornographic material. They found and documented that this finder's case involved the purchasing of children trading of children and kidnapping children all over the world. <clears throat> uh, locations which were observed uh, and were contacted in connection with this international child ring, which also included information about terrorist activity and secret bank accounts, were London, Germany, the Bahamas, Japan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Africa, Costa Rica, and Europe. The uh, customs agent, very diligent and very conscientious in, in his efforts to find out what the problem was and get to the bottom of this, contacted the Metropolitan Police Department at the location where this search took place. And I'm looking right now at his final and closing memo, and I'm going to quote it. Uh, he went there to talk to them, the Metropolitan Police. I was advised that all the passport data had been turned over to the State Department for their investigation. There were some passports that were found not only in the warehouse but also in the van. The State Department the department in turn advised the Metropolitan Police that all travel and use of the passports by the holders of the passports was within the law and no action would be taken. This included travel to Moscow, North Korea, and North Vietnam from the late 1950s to the mid-1970s. Well, weren't we at war with those people in that period of time? Yes, we were. Uh, the individual further advised me of circumstances which indicated that the investigation into the activity of the finders had become a, quote, CIA internal matter, end quote. The Metropolitan Police Department report has been classified secret and was not available for review. I was advised that the FBI had withdrawn from the investigation several weeks prior and that FBI Foreign Counterintelligence Division, that's headquarters, had directed the Metropolitan Police Department not to advise the FBI Washington Field Office of anything that had transpired. No further information will be available. No further action will be taken. By the way, the founder of the 
finders in my research, aside from this memo, is a CIA agent. You've heard of outcome-based education, I think, haven't you? That's another device that's being used to further deteriorate and destroy the uh, mental capabilities of our children. There's a program called Vista Dome Single, Single Signal. It's operating about six cycles away from the harmonic of the nation's power lines and specifically phase modulated to the exact frequency of all US TV networks. This powerful and sinister mind control and behavioral modification signal is beamed to override all television programming 24 hours per day. And in subliminal fashion, bypassing the, occasion, the conscious mind into the TV viewer's living room, this is all coordinated by the National Bureau of Standards in Boulder, Colorado. For complete details of what the video drone signal ultimately does to those people most sensitive uh, to it, see the movie uh, Vitadrome, Vider, I guess it is. Videodrome. It's thanks. <laughs> this, is in, this is in long range writing. It's based on science fact, not science fiction. Have any of you seen that movie? You probably heard about this before then, huh? Here's an article about uh, during the last 18 months, the government's been storing hundreds of tons of grain and other foodstuffs in some 50 secret underground facilities around the country. There are certain grain storage areas that are empty on a regular basis to the extent that there's hardly any grain available to the general public. Chips in the brain, this is a CIA operation. I have the documentation on it here. Uh, Project Gray Van, which is a super secret plan initiated by President Bush in 1991 to forcibly eliminate all Americans and other individuals who have been determined to be active opponents of the New World Order. Military personnel highly trained in quick combat techniques such as SWAT team tactics will be um, sanctioned to enter into a town or city and using computer listings locate those who are classified as dissidents to the New World Order. And, and there he is back there in the corner, right? I didn't think he'd bring a uniform tonight. And exterminate those people quickly and be gone within an hour or so. Um, are you familiar with, uh, I, 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 let's see, cybernetic uh, organi orgasms, organisms, I should say? <laughs> I better, everybody should go out and buy one, I'm sure. <laughs> How about using organisms? <laughs> I'll get it right, okay. A human being who is part machine and fully automated as created secretly by NASA for deep space missions. I have a documentation on that also and a number of other CIA programs. How are we doing on the time? Oh, I've got to, uh, we got an hour and 15 minutes. I got 15 minutes for questions. Huh? Hour and 50? 15, okay. Okay, and then 15. Okay, the anti-terrorism legislation, I've said it publicly many, many times. Uh, this will create a situation that will deteriorate and destroy our constitutional rights and civil liberties. Uh, let's go back to the uh, initial writing of the bill. It was un done under the Bush administration, set on the shelf. Um, it didn't pass. The, one of the authors uh, of the bill made the statement, people have to be killed before this will be passed. We had the World Trade Center bombing in 1993. Um, October 28, 1993, New York Times and LA Times, an operative, this is documented in this article, an FBI operative and talking to his FBI handler made the statements and documented the fact that the FBI knew about the bombing that was to take place and did not prevent it from happening. I don't know about the rest of you, but in, when I was in the FBI, our ultimate goal in a case of that type was to protect the victims at all costs. We did not, would never have allowed anything like that to happen the bombing to have occurred. And then uh, there were six people killed, half a million dollars in damage. Uh, 1,000 individuals were injured. And uh, the terrorism, anti-terrorism bill did not pass. So along came April 19th, 1995, and uh, there were, it is alleged that McVeigh and uh, Nichols were involved in the bombing of the Oklahoma City building. I contended right from the beginning that that was an incident created by this evil element, criminal element, within our government in order to pass the 
hasten the passage of the anti-terror legislation. I'm sure you're all very familiar with the latest uh, developments, search without search warrant. Uh, the president can label the groups as terrorists, illegal taps, or as legal as long as the police felt that they were acting in good faith, firearms sold today, using a, a robbery or um, uh, a situation later on, five years, six years now, can result in the person who originally owned the firearms and going to jail, seizure of assets, secret evidence, you uh, would not necessarily face your accuser in certain circumstances, and so forth. And you're familiar, I'm sure, since you are a well-educated group with the uh, uh, survey that was taken at the Marine Corps, 29 Palms, one out of four GI said they would shoot their fellow Americans if they did not give up their firearms. Are you aware there's a bill in Congress for a United Nations tax right today? Before Bush signed, left office, he signed a treaty that would allow us to send our troops to overseas in the event of insurrection overseas and foreign troops to come into the United States in the event of insurrection. And I have in front of me a Department of Army memo dated 29 August 1994, uh, Army Draft Regulations on Civilian Inmate Labor Program. Enclosed for your review and comment is the Draft Army Regulation on Civilian Inmate Labor Utilization and Establishing Prison Camps on Army Installations. The Draft Regulation is the compilation of all policy, message, Civilian Inmate Labor Oversight Committee, policy decisions, and lessons learned to date. The new regulations will provide the following, and it goes on and it gives a number of points. Let's see, we're in California. We're going to have Ukrainian troops. Are there any Ukrainians in the room? I hope you know how to speak Ukraine. Ukrainian Hall, okay, good. Now, I don't know about you, I'm sure that you've seen from reading Spotlight and so forth that there have been allegations of thousands of UN troops in the United States. Um, I was hesitant to accept that without personal knowledge. I talked to an individual who went out with the three other men. Uh, they heard that there were some troops down in Arizona. They went out and they claimed they found them and they saw them and there were thousands of foreign troops there. You're, are you familiar with the executive orders that are in place today? Take over all communications, medians, petroleum, gas, minerals, transportation, control highways, government, super, uh, education, et cetera, et cetera. Virtually a banking system. Virtually take over the country. You're familiar with the Federal Execution Center in Terre Haute, Indiana? Uh, brand new. It houses like 30 inmates. We haven't had a federal execution since 1963. You're familiar, I'm sure, with the uh, many prison, new prisons that are being built around the country. In Texas alone, they're building 36 new prisons. Janet Reno wants a national hit team that could operate any place in the United States, which will include civilian and military personnel in violation of the Posse Comitatus Act. And uh, basically that's, that's about what I have to say, except for, let me mention this. Um, I announced my candidacy, as I said, in late November, and um, as a result of that, within four days, um, a fellow a investigator from Washington, D.C. contacted one of my ex-girlfriends. I've been single for 22 years. I'm not playing around on any wives or anything. Contacted one of my ex-girlfriends and interviewed her. The fellow's name is John Alexander. I made a call to Washington, D.C. John Alexander is a, a close associate of the White House administration. Um, I can definitely prove that uh, my telephones are tapped. I had a friend from L.A. who called me using a, one alias. He'd never used the alias before. Within two weeks after he went, he made the call. He, his wife received a call wanting to know if uh, that person by that name lived in that house. Um, ballot access. I was not uh, given ballot access in Oregon or in Tennessee, and I was told I was not a viable candidate, and, I, and we asked what's a viable candidate, and we were told that a viable candidate is determined by the national media. <laughs> in Colorado, in Colorado, we sent the money in. There was $500 fee, application money, met the deadline, and um, about two days before the ballots were printed, we received a notice that uh, they would not place my name on the ballot. 
because I was not a viable candidate again, and they kept the $500, I might add. Um, <clears throat> about two months ago, two CIA agents came to town, I learned through my sources, because there's, quote, some guy in Las Vegas running against Bill Clinton, he can do him a lot of harm, end quote. Um, I had a potential business investor, and if this had gone through, I'd have had um, quite a bit of money in order to finance my campaign. Uh, it had been my personal money, by the way. And uh, this investor was visited by um, two Secret Service agents. On February the 9th, I contacted WMUR ABC TV Manchester Channel 9. Talked to Julie Campesino. We intended to, if this money had come through, put the uh, Clinton Chronicles on uh, that channel on a two-hour basis. I was, uh, I'd given it um, a 13-minute introduction and about a four-minute cl closing, which made it two hours. We were told that the price was $20,000 for two hours. We called them back on February the 12th. That was Friday. We talked to them the first time. That second time was a Monday. Uh, the price was then $120,000. The Nevada caucus. Nevada is a caucus state. We called the, uh, the D Democratic headquarters in Nevada. We asked them, when would the caucus meeting be held? Because we wanted to send our representative there. We want Gunderson on the ballot in Nevada. They wouldn't tell us. We had to call the national headquarters in Washington, D.C. Uh, Wednesday before two Sundays ago, and we learned that the caucus meeting was going to be a certain place, certain time, the following Sunday, four days later. We attended, some of our people attended, I was in Texas campaigning, and um, <clears throat> there were um, several uh, applications to be placed on the ballot in addition to Bill Clinton, and the speaker uh, did, accepted them but didn't uh, do anything with them, and they only, the only uh, name on the ballot in Nevada will be Bill Clinton. There were three speeches, and um, that was it. There was no, there was no voting. The, um, by the way, I met with the head of the, Nebraska, the uh, Nevada Democratic Party. I thought that a protocol, it would be nice to meet her and say hello to her. And I walked in, and she looked at me, and she says, oh, you're the candidate. I, looked, I thought I had something on my tie. You know? <laughs> and I said, yes. And uh, so we sat down and started talking, and uh, she said, uh, why did you decide to run for president? And I said, well, I was in the FBI when it was a real organization. Wait a minute, she said. J. Edgar Hoover was gay. I said, no, he wasn't. And so I argued with her about that. And then in the end, she said, well, you have your opinion, I have mine. Then I went on and explained why I was running. And then later on, I said, well, do you have any advice? She said, yes, go get another job. <laughs> and then later on, I said, can I expect any support from the Democratic Party? She said, no. I was uh, scheduled for a, um, a forum with other presidential candidates in New Hampshire on, on February the 16th. It was on a Friday. Something told me the Thursday morning before I jumped on the plane that I should probably call. And I did, and I found out it had been dropped from the schedule without being notified. One of my campaign workers went to Florida to hook up with Terry Reed. I talked to Terry about uh, giving his lecture up in New Hampshire. Uh, if my money had come through, I was going to use Terry, very frankly, and I'm not ashamed of it, to, camp to not campaign for me, but just to go out and lecture about drugs and Clinton's involvement in drugs. One of my campaign workers went to Florida to meet with some of Terry Reed's people, and he was uh, beaten up and left for dead. I've had surveillances on me. Um, my mail has been open, and uh, <clears throat> I've been cut off a number of radio shows uh, for no apparent reason. But anyway, I feel like, uh, uh, I think, of course, we all know that, has it been announced officially that Clinton has a candidacy? Well, it, the Democratic headquarters told us that he did. So just last week, I decided, I think it's time for me to change parties again. So I went over, and I re-registered, and I'm a candidate for the Independent American Party, which is the Taxpayers' Party. And I'll tell you, I, I don't know if you see my platform, but it's a, identical with the, <laughs> with the Independent American Party platform. It's identical. I, think, I don't think there's much on there that you don't have, that I don't have, if that's who you are out there. Uh, so I, I think it's very, and I'm going to help them register as many people as I can. Uh, probably be going to Arizona in another week or 10 days to help down there. It's important that we establish candidates at all levels, state, county, 
and uh, the precincts and the districts. So um, now before, in closing, uh, I'd like to mention, I ran across this book, and it's, it's a dynamite book. I didn't author it. I'd written uh, the book, How to Locate Anyone Anywhere Without Leaving Home. And uh, <clears throat> I had an opportunity to talk to uh, Galen Ross Sr. when I went through uh, San Marcos, Texas. And he has a brand new book that's called Who's Who of the Elite. And it identifies the members of the Bilderbergs, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, Skull and Bone Society, and the Committee of 300. And it's a little expensive. It sells for $30. But I'm telling you, I think it's worth it. And what I think you should do, when, if you have the $30, is buy this book and sit down. When you watch television, look up these names alphabetically, and I think you'll be surprised to learn how many of these people are in positions of authority and influence. Anyway, that's my time. Thank you very much. You might hold it up? Yeah. This is, this is available, by the way, through our office. We also have a number of other books that are available. Corruption, Satanic Cult Drug Network, um, The Mystery of the Carefree Crafted Hoax, How to Locate Anyone Anywhere Without Leaving Home. Patty helped type on that, I think, Patty, didn't you? And it's, by the way, it's great to see some of my old friends out here. Thank you very much for coming. Is that it? Thanks a lot. Ted. Oh, yeah. We're going to do the questions now, Ralph? Yeah, okay. Okay, anybody who has a question, Ralph will try to get the microphone to you or go back and see Ralph right now because we want to get it recorded so we can hear. Thank you, Mr. Gunderson, for coming tonight. It was very interesting. You said that you had uh, proof of tunnels at the McMartin School. Do you have photographs or videotapes? Yes, we, um, the, we have photographs. And we have a preliminary report back there, don't we, uh, Raven, Ray, Duran? Do we have the McMartin preliminary report back there? Do we have the McMartin preliminary report back there? We don't have. We, we've got it in our office. And we have the scientific report, which is about 186 pages long. Mm. Yes, we do have it. We have photographs. All right. Thank you, sir. That there, there were a lot of pictures taken by the TV people, by the way. And those would be available if you want to request them. Sometime in about the last 12 months, there was a, on public TV, a showing a thing, it's called Jihad America. Is this any truth to this, or is this just a drummed up thing? Uh, you'll have to enlighten me as to what Jihad America is. Jihad but. America was a uh, extremist Islamic groups that's trained in martial arts and trained as to how to use weaponry of all kinds. I don't know anything about it, I'm okay, sorry. You know, it's supposedly some undercover agents of the FBI or the CIA went in and gathered this evidence. It was on public TV within the last 16 months. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about that. Excuse me one minute. Uh, we're taking up a collection for Ted for his campaign. Rich has got a bucket back here. He'll be passing it around. So we'd like everybody to donate to his campaign. Hey, thanks a lot. Well, that's great. Yeah. That'll pay a few telephone bills, I hope. Uh, yes, every time that there's a uh, proposed uh, piece of gun, gun legislation, uh, you'll have an incident where somebody will kill a bunch of people. And uh, all of a sudden, they'll point and say, this is the reason we need to have this gun legislation. But every time they investigate these incidents, they find invariably the person that perpetrated the uh, killings was on Prozac or some kind of a psychoactive drug. Do you have any uh, information on that or could you enlighten us about that? Yes, I can. Um, I have a, a paper about three inches thick of all the various CIA programs, and one of them includes uh, mind control and people that are trained to go out and uh, create these incidents and uh, hasten the passage of anti-gun legislation. Uh, yes, sir. Are you familiar with this FBI criminal espionage investigation of the CFR Yes, I am. Being foiled, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. Are you selling that back there? No, no, I, I just, uh, this is part yeah. of a collection. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if you had any information. I'm familiar on. with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and one of my old buddies in high school was, uh, is a member of the CFR, by the way. He quit speaking to me the last time I ran into him <laughs> back at the hometown. Yes, Peter? Yes, okay, that's a good idea. My phone number in Las Vegas is 702. 
702-262-6410. Do we have any literature back there, Ray Duran, of, uh, with our phone number on it? We do? Okay. If you, on the way out the door, you can grab that literature. You can get all our books, yes. We have, uh, well, what we have is uh, how to locate anyone anywhere, the mystery of the Curfew Crafted Hoax, which is the Nebraska case, the plan by Paul Fisher, who was a candidate in 1960 against uh, Jack Kennedy, uh, the Finder's Report, the official customs report, which I read today, and the Oklahoma City Bombing Report, total package is $50 plus mailings, $5, $55. We have a three-volume set, uh, caption, Corruption Satanic Cult Drug Network, that's um, a total of $55, which kind of encompasses a lot of the material that I gave you here tonight, but documents it. We have the Clinton Chronicles, uh, which sells for $30, with mailing and handling to be $35. And we have a new video out, and um, I encourage you to buy it. It's called The Gunnison Chronicles, and it's also $35 for handling. And we have Suzanne uh, Harris. Is Suzanne here, Peter? No, Oh, Suzanne Harris, very prominent attorney uh, from um, law, the Law Loft. I'm interviewing her for 30 minutes. I'm interviewing, and we're talking about legislation and treaties um, that have been uh, passed and handed on down and uh, uh, with the, looking toward the goals of the New World Order. Also to uh, a gentleman who talks about executive orders. And by the way, executive orders are unconstitutional, totally unconstitutional. They were originally designed in order to pass directive orders down to department heads, not down to the public or not to the people. And the other uh, lady is uh, Karen Bickman, uh, who talks about the big federal land grabs. And these are all available. And then this elite book sells for $30. Yes. Uh, Ted, you, you faxed to me a step-by-step -step plan to return to constitu constitutional government. Mm -hmm. Well, I went out and made copies of that. So if anybody's interested in having Mr. Gunderson's plan to uh, return to constitutional government, here's a step-by-step -step on how to with information number and fax number at the bottom of the sheet. And I made plenty of these copies at the back of the room. And Thank I want to make a personal comment here. Um, at great personal sacrifice, Ted has been traveling around the country, and it's not been easy for him. Now, irregardless of realistically whether he wins this presidency or not, uh, he is performing an invaluable service to us patriots, educating people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hey, I, I realize it's a long shot. I realize it's a real long shot. But, uh, and if we could get a good man up there, I'm going to keep running, by the way. I'm going to run right up, uh, right up to the end. I hope that means the campaign, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to run right up to the end, uh, but if somebody as a constitutionalist steps forward and I think he's better than I am or can beat me, I'll step aside for him. Uh, it's very, very important, critical that we get somebody in the White House and get rid of these people that are throwing these things down our throat and destroying our whole civilization. By the way, I have something on my platform nobody else does, and that is to uh, get rid of the Federal Reserve System. And, and furthermore, um, get rid of the the IRS, get rid of the Department of Education. And I have a tax, but you've heard of the flat tax, the square tax, the rectangular tax, right? Well, I got the best of all, believe me. Yeah, let me just tell you about my tax plan. It's dynamite. And it'll cure our problems. What you do is you eliminate all income tax for everybody. Yeah. Now, what happens there is the middle income and lower income uh, bracket people spend what? Let's face it, we all spend what? 100% of what we earn, right? So by eliminating your income tax, you automatically have a 20 to 40% raise. That puts $2 billion a day into circulation. With $2 billion a day going into circulation, it's calculated to have 20 million new jobs. You'd have prosperity in this country like you never had before. You'd have jobs for the homeless. You'd have jobs for people on welfare. You'd have new jobs for labor. Okay? So how do you finance the government? Well, of course, we have tariffs and commerce, as the Constitution allows. But also, what I propose is that you have a $200,000 deductible. And we're going to let the rich pay, okay? And, any, and, you, and you tax the um, assets above $200,000. Like three and a third of $60 trillion would be $2 trillion in income per year. Well, the rich shouldn't complain because, after all, with two billion a day going into circulation, their assets are automatically going to go up. So they're going to be making more money. Their assets are going to be greater. So they shouldn't be upset at all about that. 
Okay. Anyway, yep. uh, I didn't. Did I tell you how I came out and I talked earlier? I, I, let me just mention how I came out in uh, New Hampshire. I came in 12th out of 21. I think I did. I mention that. Did I mention in Texas where uh, I didn't? Okay. In Texas, I uh, went down. I campaigned almost three weeks. I was by myself. I attended as many Democratic um, rallies as they would allow me to get into the where they allow me in the building, and um, they. Uh, I was, there was another lady that helped me. We spent less than $2,500, had no advertising. We were mainly on the radio talk shows, and we came away with uh, between 30 and 35,000 votes. And uh, that's, uh, it's not a final figure. That's projected figure based on 28% of the precincts that reported. Uh, so we have to be very pleased. I'm pleased with that. That means that there's 30 to 35,000 people out there listening to me, and I was saying, to those people, the same as I talked on Peter's show, and thanks, Peter, for making your show available to all of us and our cause and so forth. This man deserves a, a round of applause. And, and by the way, uh, he's, he's married to a, a lady whose maiden name was Gunderson. Yeah, there she is. There she is, Miss America. Okay. Anyway, I think we did pretty well in Texas. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased. I'm just sorry I couldn't get on more ballots. Um, yes, another question. Yes, sir. You um, uh, mentioned the Franklin cover-up in 1989. Yes. Could you, could you tell me how to obtain documentation of Bush's attendance or one of those? How, how we obtained it? Yeah, no, sir. His, his, the documentation that he attended. Yes, the documentation is from uh, several of the children who attended the parties. And um, I have personally have uh, a, si a, a, si uh, a videotape from a kid who saw him at one of those parties. This is in the book, by the way, in Franklin cover-up book. You know, I was on a radio show in Las Vegas uh, not too long, and I named these names, Harold Anderson, um, Bob Wadman, da, da da and so on and so forth. And right after the show, some guy, some fellow called the station. He said he wanted a copy of that tape. Well, I know what he was doing. He was going to plan on having me sued for naming these people. And I know that, of course, his research indicated that they'd already been named. And by the way, John Franklin challenged these people. He couldn't get anybody to write it to um to publish his book, The Franklin Cover-Up, he, he said, I beg you to sue me, he said to him publicly. They wouldn't sue him. And of course, they didn't want to sue him because all this information would be made public then. Right, yes, question. Hi, uh, yes. Um, I've heard a rumor for the past 10 years, and this time the source was a man by the name of John Lear who claims that the attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan in, in 81 was orchestrated by the same people who did Kennedy through a Manchurian candidate. Do you know anything about that? I don't have any documentation, but it, uh, I've heard similar stories. And for years, uh, I've went along with the Warren Commission report on the Kennedy assassination until I saw where Dr. Cyril Speck, or not Cyril Speck, uh, Weck, Cyril, Cyril Weck out of uh, Pittsburgh, uh, said that, uh, who was in part of the autopsy, I believe, said that there was more than one gunman. And I know Cyril Weck. Uh, in fact, I've had him work on two of my homicide cases that I've worked in the past. And he's probably one of the most renowned pathologists in the country. And I'll take his word for it against the Warren Commission any day. And, <laughs> and yet I went, along with, I went along with the party line all those years, and um, I must have blinders on. But, uh, of course, I was being fed the propaganda that you, you're given. But in the FBI, I can understand. We had 164 categories which we were responsible for. And if information came to our attention within those 164 categories, uh, we investigated. If it didn't, we put it in what we call the zero file. So I don't blame the FBI agents, per se. It was only after I became involved in the McDonald case and another number of other cases, the McMartin case, um, and the Victor Glushin bombing in the Marina del Rey, uh, a bomb under the front seat in the gas tank, uh, two bombs. Um, the FBI, ATF, and the sheriff's office all said it was suicide and $2 million of insurance we were brought in, our firm was brought in. We established homicide without any doubt. Six out of seven insurance companies paid. We went to trial for the 7th Old Republic of Chicago, and we won in a, in a trial. Uh, they said the judge ruled in our favor that he was murdered. There was not, a, not a suicide. Another people, another, they, I call it suicided, right? Uh, but anyway, that's another story. But then more recently, the Oklahoma City bombing, there's no question in my mind. Uh, that uh, John Doe II is an uh, agent of, uh, and or, or a, uh, an agent, an agent on, and or an informant or an operative for the federal government. Yes, question. 
Ted, you mentioned earlier Project Gray Van. Can you just give us a few more details on that? This is the assassination? On Project Gray Van specifically. Yeah, I'll read what I have here. I don't think I read it all. Um, these are longhand notes. That's why I messed up on uh, whatever. I won't say it again. <laughs> I'll, read the, I'll read the whole memo. Some of these memos I didn't read completely. I just skimmed them, if I can find it. Project Grayvan is a super secret plan initiated by President Bush in 1991 to forcibly eliminate all Americans and other individuals who have been determined to be active opponents of the New World Order. Military personnel highly trained in quick combat techniques, such as SWAT team tactics, will be sanctioned to enter into a town or city and using computer listings locate those who are classified as dissidents to the New World Order and, ex and to exterminate these people quickly and be gone within an hour or so, moving from city to city in such a manner as to not leave much trace for local authorities to follow. The plan is to claim these people eliminated were involved in drug dealings and that it was merely part of a drug war and to keep the information out of the news media. That's all I have on it. Now, let me just mention one other thing. I met with a CIA agent not too long ago, and um, we were in a restaurant, and um, he was filling me in on some information, giving me details about CIA activity, and um, he started crying. And um, he told me that for years he thought he was solving a problem, and all of a sudden he woke up one day and he realized he was the problem. And he said that of all the horrible things that he's done, and I know he's killed people, he said it's really starting to bother him. And he said he has splitting headaches constantly, he can't sleep at night, and uh, he's really, I don't know what's going to happen to him. I told him he had to go see a psychiatrist. But there's two groups in the CIA. There's the good old boys who realize that the orders they were given were not of humanitarian and in the best interests of those of us who we consider ourselves Christians. And then there's a new kid on the block. And the old timers are working diligently and are in competition with the new kid on the block. And these are the young guys out of college and so forth, who are doing all the uh, professional assassinations and the killings today. And um, there were two, ex well, there, once, I think CIA is like the mafia. Once you're in, you're in, and you're never identified. But <clears throat> um, two of them have told me that we're the, we're the biggest terrorists in the world and the biggest drug dealers in the world. Yes, question. Yes, thank you for coming. I have a comment and a question. Um, by way of uh, personal experience, a couple of years ago, I did attend an American Independent Party um, convocation uh, for purpose of, it was more like a business meeting, and there was definitely pro-skinhead white supremacist literature on the table for distribution and pickup, so I wa want you to be cautioned to keep your eyes open for that kind of stuff. You don't want that mud yeah, slinging right. on yourself. I appreciate that. Okay. They've called me other things already, so it doesn't matter. Well, Couldn't put out the put out the word I'm a homosexual. Yeah, you need to distance. <laughs> you need to distance yourself from that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, secondly, uh, question: Do you take Michael Reconosciuto to be credible? Absolutely. Uh, Spotlight last year printed a story that uh, where he was quoted through you as saying that was my bomb. Do you take that as a true story? Absolutely, meaning that he developed that bomb. Okay, so you stand by that. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll be you also believe that he was on the October surprise flight and also that he was... Let me f answer that first Insla question. Insla. Let, let's come back to those last two questions. Okay. Um, we, know it was, uh, we know the bomb. We have the contract number. It's uh, manufactured by Dinah Nobel in Salt Lake City. Uh, we have um, uh, written a letter to the... Uh, Department of the Army asking for details on, based on the contract number. We have not received a response. I just can't understand that, by the way. Yes, that's, uh, there's no question about that, in my opinion. And what was the other question? I've, uh, uh, well, you had also said that you were part of the uh, October surprise flight and also that you saw confirmation that this was 
Well, I don't know about the October surprise flights, but I know he's part of the Inslaw problem. I, I have personal knowledge of that, and I have the affidavits, and I've talked to Bill Hamilton. You're, you're familiar with the Inslaw, the $10 million heist of the uh, computer system, Bill Hamilton, Promise Software. Yes, ma'am. I have a question which really has two parts. Do you know anything about the Delta Force or the Fifth Column Group and their plan to restore us to the gold standard? Also, in connection, in connection with that, there was an article that uh, appeared in the uh, Ventura County paper just this week, and I understand it's creeping out all over the nation, where a uh, group claims Texas independence, the restoration to the independent nation status and many states have uh, declared that and have uh, the paperwork and everything in process to reclaim independent status. Would you comment about those yes. two things? Uh, the first question um, was on the uh, fifth column, yeah, Delta group, yeah, fifth column. Um, I'm sure you're familiar that the fifth column is uh, computer wizards who gotten into the bank accounts in the Switzerland and uh, they're supposedly handing uh, copies of the bank accounts back to the congressmen, senators, the politicians saying uh, uh, resign or be exposed. I have, I don't know exactly which senators and congressmen have been identified, but I have confirmed that through my CIA contacts, that those men do exist and as a matter of fact I have I'm, uh, have a, I'm not a direct contact with them, but I'm one layer away from them. So I do have that confirmed that Jim Nichols, or um, Jim Norman is telling the truth. Uh, I don't know anything about the gold standards. I know that um, I would have to say that these men are patriotic Americans. This, these are probably the good old boys. There's supposed to be three, uh, three of them active, one of them is injured, and one of them died. The independent nation status. Um, last, several days ago, over the weekend, I think it was, huh? 18th, 2,000 people marched on the state capitol and demanded that Bush vacate the, his office in Austin, Texas. <laughs> and, um, and another 2,000 joined them and went on over to IRS and told IRS to get out of the state of Texas. <laughs> Okay, we collected uh, $173 here for Ted's campaign, and we want to th thank him for coming here tonight and answering all the questions and telling us all of these things. Let's give him a round of applause. Thanks a lot. But I'm going <laughs> to... Yeah. You, you, <laughs> thank, thanks a lot. So you've seen this, and you've seen this, and, and what are the others that they do? I forget. But if Bill Clinton goes like this every once in a while. Well, mine is this, right? <laughs> thank God we're all free. Let's hope we can stay that way. Ted, uh, Ted yes. we've completed the audio, but we've got some more questions, so you want to hang on? Just sure, I'll, I'll stay all night. It doesn't matter. I'm just driving back to Las Vegas. <laughs> I got gas money. Mr. Gunderson, uh, since you were with the FBI, um, I just uh, want to know if uh, there were some uh, underground uh, naval bases in the east and west coast, if you know anything about them, and maybe in the island of New Georgia. I've heard about them. I don't know anything about them. Um, I understand that we have an oil reserve in Bakersfield. There's, there's a lot of controversy up there that the government's selling it off. and. It's the oil reserve for the naval fleet. Do you know, anybody know anything about that? You heard that? The dome or something? Yeah, I don't know anything about that. I'm sorry I don't know anything about the underground <laughs> naval. Sorry about that. Dad, I have a question. I met with a producer not too long ago who was asked to view an 8 millimeter video tape which was shot of the Murray building in Oklahoma about halfway up. And she was asked by some Army personnel to verify, was the tape tampered, altered, anything? What it basically showed was a helicopter landing on the Murray Building. Um, several, I think she said five 
people uh, dressed in jump or fatigue clothes getting out of the helicopter, disappearing. She saw only from the waist up because of the parapet wall at the top. They disappeared, and if I'm not mistaken, they were gone for six minutes. He came back, got into the helicopter. Helicopter took off, and I think it was three minutes later, the building implodes. And I'm wondering if you've heard anything. She asked, can I have a copy of the tape? And the personnel said, do you love, want to live? And she said, yes. And he said, forget it. Anyway, uh, have you heard of such a tape or uh, anything like this? No, I have not. I'm sorry. Right. I haven't heard about it. I'd like to get my hands on it, though. Yeah, I would just like to comment. Uh, in this paper that's at the back of the table, the Reality Press, we have a pretty good coverage of the... Uh, Texas Republic and uh, next month which will be out the fourth we're, we're updating there were three indictments served one on the IRS uh, one on the uh, de facto state and one on George Bush Bush so these are free they're in the back of the room Ted I'd like to get this on on record um, Senator your Dull. name your name sir um, Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Senator Dull uh, ran for vice president with uh, Gerald Ford in 1976. <clears throat> he replaced uh, Rockefeller when, when Rockefeller went off. According to a mutual friend, Kathy O'Brien, and she was part of when she was part of the MK Ultra Project Monarch program, he used as a sex slave did not, in fact, to the best of your knowledge, Senator Dull's running mate, Gerald Ford, force her to have oral copulation, or perform oral copulation upon him when she was a mere child. Kathy O'Brien? Yes. Well, she, she said every, every living president except Jimmy, Jimmy Carter had sex with her. Yeah. So there, there's no question about that. Well, that's what she told me. Now, there has been rumors that uh, Gerald Ford was a practicing Satanist. And? And you have heard about that. Yes. Do you think that there's anything uh, to back that up? I don't have any f documentation on it, only what I've been told, what I've heard. And then she stated that uh, while in the company of the Clintons, that not her, but her husband, had an affair with Bill Clinton. Is that correct? Um, yes, she, she mentioned that. She said that. Mm -hmm. uh, anal intercourse or something of that nature. Right. Or oral copulation. Uh, that's what yes. I understand. And still one other thing. Yeah. Uh, that Hillary Clinton uh, was interested in her, uh, the shape of her vagina. Or there was some mutilation. And I, I know this sound, all sounds rather bizarre, but this is a very bizarre and very true story. And that uh, Hillary Clinton wanted to take her on and did. Is that correct? That's what she says. <clears throat> By the way, I have the okay. book here. Is, to the best of your knowledge, is uh, Hillary Clinton AC and DC? Well, just what Kathy's told me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you have uh, any other I, I don't have any personal experience there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we've had private conversations, and you uh, stated that there might be other women who would testify to that. There are, uh, to my knowledge, I've been told there are five presidential models. That's what they call them. Um, these are l very pretty, attractive ladies who are from birth trained to be sex slaves to uh, uh, presidents and top dignitaries in the government. And there are five of them living today. I have personally met with two of them. And they would testify to having affairs with the first lady would probably like to be the first man. Um, the, uh, of course, Ka Kathy will. The other one is in hiding. Mm -hmm. And the, the other three, um, I've not talked to them. I think maybe someday I will. Do you sure. fear if this story is not revealed that uh, Kathy's life might not be a long one? That's right. And, and the women who, the three ladies who are in hiding, uh, fear for their life. They have not come forward, and I don't know that they ever will. The other lady who has um, given me a statement, uh, video, and uh, also a signed statement, um, is um, she's not advertising, but you know, she's, I have talked to her. She did, that, did Kathy not, in, in fact, state that her, her uh, 
four-year-old child was first uh, molested by uh, a pedophile president named George Bush. That's right. Okay. Mm. Thank you. You have and pretty good uh, memory, Anthony. <laughs> um, I'm keeping a, a close tab on our Reichstag 95, and it seems to be doing very well in exposing the, the bad guys. And as a consequence, uh, we had a delay in the anti-Bill of Rights bill, and we have to do something about that right now. And I think Peter, uh, wherever Peter is, and uh, Suzanne Harris uh, has been on top of this particular left legislation. We have to put the kibosh to it right now, and you're invited again on my show. Good, uh, thank you. Uh, maybe tomorrow night. All right, good, okay. thanks. Anthony, I'm sure everybody knows who Anthony is, and Peter. Peter and Suzanne Harris are great Americans. Uh, they've done a fabulous job at the law loft, researching and so forth. Yes, sir. Uh, another one of our biggest problems in this country is the fact that we have a corrupt judiciary system. We have a Justice Department who will only stand up for the government and is not interested in justice for the people, only in keeping the government out of trouble. Uh, we have judges that can't be sanctioned uh, in any way. Uh, this is not constitutional, but they seem to have been able to make up their own uh, code to keep themselves from being prosecuted. Uh, I'd like to have your feelings on this. Yes. Uh, I've seen it time and time again in the last 16 years, uh, first with the Jeffrey McDonald case, uh, Judge Dupree, um, there were 24 motions entered by the um, defense and all but one were denied and there were eight entered by the prosecution and all were accepted by the judge. Evidence was destroyed, evidence was altered. Um, I have a summary of that case. I think if you have never read it, I'd suggest that you call my office and we'll get a copy to you that just documents corruption right from the beginning. And that judge, um, no question about it, was very partial and prejudiced against Dr. McDonald. That was an Army drug cover-up. There's no question about it. I've seen it also on a number of occasions in cases that I've worked where you have uh, uh, child custody cases. And the uh, perpetrator, or the one who molests the kid, uh, oftentimes is given the child over the straight and the honest parent, uh, even though it's proven that the honest parent is the one who should have the kid. Yes? Well, it seems to me that if we don't get the judiciary straightened out, we'll never be able to bring any of the government officials uh, under any scrutiny and get any problem solved in this country, as they'll just keep on going and covering it up and it goes on and on infinitum. That's right. Some years back in research, um, it, there was indication from my research that the entrance into the underground cities is through the petroleum uh, buildings in each city. Do you know anything about that? No, I don't. I'm sorry. Uh, at that time, I believe that they and I, I'm not, I don't have this positively verified, but I believe that they have a card, a certain card, and that will admit them into the underground cities. They have a, the CIA has a device or the government, I don't know if it's CIA or not. Okay. They can go through solid rock at the rate of five miles an hour okay. and, and build a big tunnel. Well, the huge tunnel will take a train through it. Yeah. The um, genealogy, if you want to be interested in the genealogy of George Bush and all the people involved, goes right back through to with the same people involved with the assassination of all our presidents. Bush, uh, Clinton, I mean Lincoln's stepmother was Sarah Bush Johnston of the bank, Bush banking family at the time. In response to Anthony's question of whether Hillary is AC or DC, I can assure him that she is. I have inside information on that. She was caught dead in the act in the White House. Uh, my second uh, question for you um, is on Dr. Jeffrey McDonald. What is the status on him now? Jeffrey McDonald? Yes. Um, Dr. McDonald is still serving three consecutive life sentences. He's lost uh, three or four appeals. I forget, there's so many I can't, I forget. The attorneys supposedly claim that they're working on another appeal now. Um, 
and that's it. We're trying, we're in the process of, uh, did, if any of you ever read uh, Fatal Justice, not Fatal Vision, but Fatal Justice, it's a book out by Jerry Potter. It tells the true story of the McDonald case, and there's a movie that's um, being produced on that. I hadn't read Fatal Justice, but I have read The Fatal Vision, which was kind of a slanted left Well, Fatal Vision was fiction. That's right. They only mentioned my name in there three times. <laughs> Fatal Justice mentioned it throughout the book. So. Go buy Fatal Justice. Okay. Are you aware that he was kept in solitary confinement several years? Yeah, and what, sir? He was kept in solitary confinement for several oh, yes. years. Oh, uh, yes. I don't know if he still is or not. N no, he's not, but he was. And there was an attempt on his life in jail, too. Ultimate evil. <clears throat> Those uh, folks, the few of you that might know who I am, I'm reasonably selective in my friends at this point in time, for those of you that know why. Okay, I consider Ted, Ted and I are, are very good friends. If I made a list of 15 or 20 people out of all the people in the United States of America, okay, that are really out there that have a big pair of eyes like he does to step forward to be able to do this, that's the wrong part of the anatomy. Uh, Ted would be really top, maybe in the top ten out of all the people that are out here trying to kick tail on these bad guys. And I want you guys to realize something. I mean, some of us, you know, we're all crazy, the guys that are out in front. Anyhow, obviously, we're all mental retards or something. There's something wrong with us. But you have to understand, it takes a lot of guts to have all the time in that he has had in the FBI and to come forward, you know, and do his numbers like he does. So I hope you really appreciate it. And I respect Ted uh, at a real high level compared. Because we got a lot of jerks out here. And Ted is not one of them. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Um, Bob, uh, Bob deserves a lot of respect, too. Uh, if you, you might just very briefly tell him about the attempt to kill you. About which? No, we've already which done one? that. They know the it. Which one? The poison. The bulk of these characters already know, uh, I think, the, you know. I really appreciate it. It's, it's, I won't go into the whole thing again, but uh, next time I'm talking, you can speak in here. Uh, most of these are all friends, Ted, so uh, I guess they're filled in. Listen, on the reconnaissance thing, this gentleman asked about reconnaissance and his uh, uh, veracity and whether he's uh, straight up or down or not. Many years ago, in 1988, I was directly involved with uh, the Inslaw investigations. And uh, Reconnaissance was directly involved with making the alterations on that stolen computer that Edwin Meese and Reagan's people were involved with. That's all straight up and down. I would say that Reconnaissance's information is probably 98% correct, and the 2% would only be an error. Uh, I think he's completely straight, the same as uh, Ted does. Bob. Thanks for coming by, yeah, Ted. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. What? Oh, one more. Okay. Just a quick question for Ted. Um, in my readings regarding uh, other federal, former federal government employees, CIA operatives and uh, military intelligence guys and stuff, a lot of them are afraid to come forward and talk because of the secrecy agreements they've signed and uh, subtle threats that are made against, you know, their, their, their pensions and in many cases, you know, out and out threats. And I was just curious if you've had any of that kind of pressure on yourself. Yes, I have. Um, actually, uh, I've never divulged any secrets uh, that I knew when I was in the FBI. Everything that I've told you tonight I developed after I left the FBI, so I don't have any obligation to keep it quiet. Um, also, I was asked uh, last fall by the Society of Former Special Agents of the FBI to explain why I have made certain critical remarks of the FBI, and they sp specifically directed my attention to six or eight statements I've made publicly, including that the FBI is corrupt. And um, uh, so uh, they, uh, they said either uh, recant or r resign, and if you don't resign, we're going to expel you. And I took every statement, and I documented when I made it and where the documentation was. I furnished it along. I submitted a document about four and a half, five inches thick to back up my statements, and I haven't heard from them since. I'm still a member of the Society of Former Special Agents of the FBI. But in the letter, I told them, I said, it's very obvious to me that this inquiry was directed by the FBI itself and not by the Society, and I said, ensure that the FBI itself receives a copy of this response, okay? 
Now, in the Oklahoma City bombing, um, I immediately furnished the results of my investigation to the FBI, to, the, to our inspector, to uh, uh, Stephen Jones, the McVeigh's attorney, to ICI explosives in Dallas, immediately furnished it to him. And of all of those uh, agencies and or groups that received the results of my investigation, and I begged uh, the FBI to come see me, and I, and I begged our inspectors committee to come interview me. Of all of those, only uh, uh, Stephen Jones and investigators came and interviewed me. You see, the thing is, if the FBI would just come to see me, I would just sit down with my tape recorder and tell them all the things that I said tonight, and I would tell them where they can go to get the documentation. In fact, I'd furnish them the documentation. But they don't want to talk to me because they don't want to hear this because they don't want to have to be placed in a position where they might have to do something about it. It's that simple. And I know that. And I'm just bragging them to come see me. Please, FBI. Have you got any plants here tonight, by the way? Come see me. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I have no way of uh, determining that at this point. Uh, Ted, just one more quick thing. Has Jeffrey McDonald ever considered writing a book from his standpoint what happened in, in his case? Uh, no, he, had, um, he hired uh, Joe McGinnis to write the first book, and he thought it was going to be pro-McDonald, and it ended up being just the opposite. And um, he sued McGinnis for, and again, obtained an out-of-court settlement of $325,000. And then uh, the latest was Jerry Potter, and uh, Jeff helped on that uh, version of Fatal Justice by Jerry Potter. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, they didn't tell the whole story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a book someday, and I'll tell the whole story. Okay, this closes our program. Let's give uh, Ted a big hand for all the wonderful information and taking a stand like he has. Thanks a lot, folks. Enjoyed being here. Appreciate that. God bless you. For anybody who wants a